Yeah, I agree. All right, so trig derivatives are essentially a pattern. And what we're going to do today is compare the pattern for previous derivatives as well as the derivatives of trig functions. In order to be able to successfully prove the derivative of trig functions, we need four limits. So what I'm going to do is go back to chapter two and re-review four of the limits we've previously discussed in this class. So the limit as h approaches zero of sine x, sorry, is zero, as well as the limit as h approaches zero of cosine x. Sorry, those should be cosine x and sine x. I think I was jumping ahead to the down below stuff when I was typing yesterday. So the limit as h approaches zero of sine x is sine x because there's no h to plug into. And the limit as h approaches zero of cosine x is cosine x because once again, there's no h to plug into. So the limit is simply the function at that point. Now, in the past, we had two limits we memorized. We had memorized the limit as h approaches zero of sine h over h. We had previously investigated and determined that that was equal to one. And then the limit as h approaches zero of cosine h minus one all over h, we previously investigated and said it was equal to zero. So having these four limits memorized will allow us to prove the derivative of cosine and sine. Yes. So what is the derivative of sine x using the definition of the derivative? So the definition of the derivative is that limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. That is the formal definition of the derivative. This is the one we use when we are not approaching a point. So if we want to find the derivative of sine x, then that's going to become the limit as h approaches zero of sine x plus h minus sine x all over h. And then in trig, you learned about something called the angle sum identity. So the angle sum identity says that the sine of x plus h can be rewritten using sines and cosines and no longer adding the angles together. So we now have the limit as h approaches zero. For sine, it becomes the sine of x times the cosine of h plus the cosine of x times the sine of h. So you replace this part right here with the angle sum identity. For the limit, yes. And then you only have to do this once minus sine of x all over h. No, you only have to know it for this proof right now. Like once we, once we prove the derivative of sine and cosine, 
You never have to prove it again. So we're just proving why the derivative is the derivative. I was like, pretty sure I don't give you a definition of a derivative with a trig. <laughs> the limit as h approaches zero. I'm running out of room in my schedule. So what happens is that h in the denominator, we can rewrite this as two separate fractions, and we can kind of factor out a like term. So if you notice here, we have the sine of x and cosine h plus the cosine of x and sine h and then minus the sine x. So what I'm going to do is rearrange my terms so that both of these sine x's are near each other. Sorry, I didn't realize I was writing in yellow. And then if you look at the two fractions, so all I did was apply the property of limits that says you can sum two limits together and their limit is still the same. Here we can take out a GCF of sine x. And hopefully what you notice is all four limits I gave you at the top are now in this problem. Uh, so if you take the idea of multiplication rules, uh, sine of x over 1 times that is the same because you multiply your numerators and multiply your denominators. So, like, technically, they are all still over h. So, the limit as h approaches 0 of sine x is sine x. The limit as h approaches 0 of cosine h minus 1 over h is 0. So, this first limit is gone because it becomes 0. And then the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine x is cosine x. And the limit as h approaches 0 of sine h over h is 1. So we get cosine x times 1. So 0 plus cosine x times 1 is cosine x. And it is safe to say that the derivative of sine x is cosine x. So let's find out what the derivative of cosine x is. So go ahead and set up your limit using the definition of the derivative. And then again, you need that angle sum addition property for cosine. And um, cosine is a little different than sine. So for the sine, it's cosine and sine multiplied by each other. For the cosine angle identity, it is the cosine of x and the cosine of h 
and then it's the sine of x and the sine of h, and the sine becomes the opposite of what it is on the problem. So since this is cosine x plus h, when you use your angle sum identity for cosine, it becomes the cosine of x, the cosine of h multiplied together, and then it's minus the sine of x, sine of h, minus cosine x, all over h. And then just like in the previous example, we're going to rearrange my numerators so that the cosine of x's are near each other. So I'm just going to rearrange my terms. And again, technically that denominator, since it's a single term, can get rewritten as two separate fractions being added together. Uh, technically right now I have this as one big bracket and now I'm gonna break it into two smaller. So now at this point, you have all of your limits. So the limit of cosine h minus 1 over h and sine h over h are both of our rules. So the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine h minus 1 over h is 0. So this whole function zeroes out again. Yes, because you have two denominators of H, so you need two limits. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this becomes like zero minus the limit as h approaches 0 of sine x sine h becomes sine x times 1. So it becomes negative sine x. So what that means is the derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. And at this point, you never have to take a definition of the derivative again to use the derivative of sine and cosine unless the directions tell you you have to. I don't think on any of your homeworks tonight, maybe one of the other four trig derivatives, but I honestly would have to go look at it. Okay, so these are your six trig derivatives. This is what you will need to memorize. Uh, I have a little quizzes, so today I'll let you put out this handout, and we'll do like a quizzes, and just get practice doing the trig derivatives. So the derivative of all trig derivatives that start with C are negative. The derivative of all trig functions that start with C are negative. So derivative of cosine is negative sine. Derivative of cosecant is negative cotangent cosecant. Derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. 
to help you remember the derivative of tangent and the derivative of secant, you're going to think about the ship, the S, S, T. So for the derivative of secant and derivative of tangent, you want to think about the ship S, S, T, because the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So you have secant times secant. And the derivative of secant is secant tan. So you, if you can remember the ship S, S, T, then it works forwards and backwards for your trig derivatives of tan and secant. Does everybody see that? I just think it's a nice, easy way to help you remember. I cannot take credit, though. That was a Spencer Turling mnemonic device. Find the following derivatives. You have y equal x squared sine x. So I need to use the trig rules and what other rule? And, okay, there's another one, product. So this is like two functions being multiplied together. This is f of x, this is g of x. So your derivative dy dx is equal to the first, which is x squared, times derivative of the second, and we said derivative of sine x is always, so it's first times derivative of the second, plus the second, which is sine x, times derivative of the first, derivative of x squared is, so cleaning it up, it's x squared cosine x, plus 2x sine x. Just be very, very aware that the 2x and the x inside sine don't multiply together. That is considered the angle of the trig function, and it never multiplies with our outside variables. So even though there aren't parentheses there, it's assumed there are parentheses. And sometimes in your notes, I type them because that's how psycho I am. Yes. Yes. That's what I said. Today's not rough. We have trig derivatives. And what are the rule? Quotient. So remember, it's Hi ho, hi ho, soft to calc you go. Let's ho de hi minus hi de ho all over ho ho. So it's the rhyme. I came up with the rhyme. The ho de hi minus hi de ho was not me. Because it's like the snow, it's the seven white snow way in the seven tours. Hi ho, hi ho. It's off to work you go. Da, 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 da. It's, I don't know. I just took that song and turned it into a way to remember it. Some calc teachers don't do hi-ho. They do high-low for like the high part of the fraction and the low part. But low D high minus high D low is a lot harder for me to say. What? So it's denominator times derivative of the numerator. So again, remember SST, so derivative of secant is secant tan minus numerator times derivative of the denominator Derivative of 1 is 0. Derivative of tan is secant squared. 
all over denominator squared. Distribute in the first part and in the second And then it's good habit to clean up. So what you'll notice is each term contains a secant. Sometimes we'll get Pythagorean identities. So we wanna take out that secant X just to make sure we don't get a Pythagorean identity or something that cancels with the denominator. So your Pythagorean identities, which I'll give you a handout with all of them on it. So in trig, you have a couple of Pythagorean identities. And basically the easiest one in trig is sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So if on your handout or on a problem you ever have sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, you wanna replace sine squared plus cosine squared with that one. For the tangents and the secants, it is one plus tangent squared equals secant squared. So you could also say that tan squared minus secant squared is equal to negative one. So here, we can replace that with negative one. And for your first test, I usually make using the identities your um, like bonus opportunities. So like if you recognize that that was negative one, you would get like a bonus point. If you left it here, that's perfectly acceptable. Yeah, with all the identities on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like some people stress out that they have to memorize that and the work. So that's why I say like for that first test, like it's not, it's not mandatory. We haven't done enough practice with it. On a free response, yes. And on a multiple choice, they pr I don't know if they'd give you one that would require that knowledge. Well, sometimes it simplifies though. Like it's not unnecessary because once we get into like the chain rule and higher order derivatives, they cancel. So like if you were to take the second derivative of that problem, Canceling that part out makes it so much more simple than leaving it in. Like that's when it starts to become like. So it's more for like where we're going than where we are. Okay, so in number three, you have a product rule because you have x times cosine x and then a difference of cotan. So it's first times derivative of the second. Derivative of any c trig function is negative. So derivative of cosine is negative sine. So first times the root of the second plus second times the root of the first minus the derivative of cotan. 
So cotan is a lot like tangent, derivative of tangent, secant squared. Derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. So you get negative x sine x plus cosine x. A minus a minus becomes a positive cosecant squared x. And trig derivatives are gross and don't really clean up. Now, we briefly talked about this the other day when we did the... Oh, yeah, sure. So in this problem, this is a lot like that table problem where we had like 5 f of x. And if I asked you to find the derivative of 5 f of x, you didn't need the product rule because five was a constant. So it just became five F prime of X. Well, that's very similar for trig functions with coefficients in front. This is not a product rule because six is a coefficient, not a function. So our derivative is negative six sine x minus four cosecant cotangent. Is everybody okay? Like you don't need me to show you that if you did the product rule, it's not, it wouldn't mess you up. So just in case you're nervous about it, if you did the product rule, you'd have first with this six times derivative of the second. So you'd write negative sine X plus the second. So you'd write your cosine X times derivative of first. And you would see that the derivative of six is zero. So it would cancel out if you accidentally did 6 cosine x as a product rule. Same with the 4 and the cosecant. A lot of trig functions will be applications. So here, this is sort of like a variation of Hooke's Law, in which you have a weight hanging from a spring, the weight is stretched down five units from rest. So like if this is the weight hanging on the string at rest, what we do is stretch it down. So you're being stretched down five units beyond rest. So like that negative five is at t equals zero. So its function when it's being stretched is given by s of t equals five cosine t. So what we wanna do is determine its velocity and acceleration equation. So velocity or V of T would be five derivative of cosine T, which is negative sine T. So our velocity is negative five sine T. And our acceleration would be negative five Derivative of sine is cosine. 
So acceleration would be negative 5 cosine t. So there's my velocity. There's my acceleration. Describe the motion. So in order to describe its motion, I want to talk about a couple things. So if you look at your original function, what's the amplitude of the original function? What's the amplitude of that original function? Five. So what's that make the range of the original function? Yeah, the range is 10, right? Because it's going to be 5 to negative 5. Because it's going to be, it's going to go down 5 units. And then when that spring launches back up, it's going to go up 5 units. So it's going to go 5 units above rest and 5 units below rest. So the total range is 10 units. What's the period of a cosine? The period's 2 pi. That's the range. That's the, that's the range of cosine. But this range is being stretched by 5 units because that's how far we pulled it down. So the period is 2 pi. So what that means is that from time 0 to 2 pi, it will go from rest, down, up, hit rest again, and go down and back up, right? Because that would give you one full cycle of cosine. That's right behind you. Okay. So that weight's going to go up and down between negative 5 and 5 on its position. When would it be at rest? When would it be at rest? At what time t? Perfect when it's at its max or its min. So, okay, and when does cosine equal one? Yes, yes, or two pi or zero. <laughs> Threw me off with the negative pi. I was like, uh, yeah, just no time can't be negative. Yeah. Is the object accelerating or decelerating based on the acceleration function? Yeah, because acceleration is, yeah. So over time, what that means is that the spring is slowing down. And the last example, we want to find the equation of the tangent and the normal one. 
So in order to find the equation of a tangent in the normal line, we have to identify y minus f of a equals f prime of a at x minus a. So in this case, what's my a value? Yeah. So I'm going to get y minus f of 2 equals f prime of 2 at x minus 2. So in order to be able to fill in to that formula page, I need f of 2 and f prime of 2. So f of 2 is kind of easy. You just plug in. You get tan 2 over 2. And we can leave it as tan 2 over 2. And then f prime of 2 means I need the derivative of f of x. So that's a quotient rule. So that's a ho di minus hi the o all over hello. And since secant squared and tan is not, I can't clean that up like we could with the tangent squared and the secant squared for our Pythagorean identities. So f prime of 2 is equal to 2 secant squared 2 minus tan 2 all over 2 squared, which is 4. So to write this as an equation of a tangent line, we're going to use a calculator and get approximate three decimal values for f of 2 and f prime of 2. So you want to make sure you are in radians and tangent of 2 divided by 2 is negative 1.093 and f prime of 2 well, secant squared is really the same as 1 over cosine. So on your calculator, it would be 2 divided by cosine of 2 squared. Because secant squared again, is also the same as saying the secant of 2 squared. And then on your calculator, you do it as 1 over the cosine of 2 squared. Minus the tangent of 2, all divided by 4. So you should get 3.4. Four, three, three. So the equation of the tangent line is y minus 1.093 equal to 3.433 x minus 2. Yes, thank you. And then you have to get your reciprocal slope, which is the opposite and 1 over that 3.433. So you get negative 0 0.291 x minus 2 for your normal line.
So again, today, even though we were learning the new trig functions, we went through all of the key ideas of topic for chapter two. We had definition of the derivative. We had tangent lines, normal lines, product rule, and quotient rule, as well as position velocity acceleration. Corey, I'm going to go backwards. Well, I guess there's not. I have it. It is recorded. You probably have.